So Triple P stands for the Positive Parenting Program. Uh, and it's developed, I'm sorry, it's delivered uh, by multiple agencies in the Windsor Essex, Essex County area. <clears throat> it was developed by Professor Matt, Sa Matt Sanders and his colleagues at the University of Queensland in Australia. And unfortunately, no one you are trained as a Triple P facilitator, we do not get to go to Australia, unfortunately. Um, it's been in, it's been originated about 30 years ago, and to the best of my knowledge, it's been in Canada for about 10 years, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, it is an evidence-based program, multi-level parenting support program, and by evidence-based, I mean locally, uh, when we do Triple P groups, uh, there's assessment data sheets that parents fill out at the beginning of the program and at the end of the program, and we collect data to share with the parents. And lastly, it aims to prevent behavioral and emotional and developmental problems by children by enhancing the knowledge and skills of parents. So helping parents create a loving, predictable, consistent, and supportive environment. So you can look at these little darlings. I'm sure you can all identify with some of these faces that we've seen. So positive parenting in a high stress society, first and foremost, remain positive, remain calm, and be consistent. Positive parenting is a great way to parent. Children who grow up with positive parenting tend to do well in school, make friends a little easier, feel, feel good about themselves, and less likely to have behavioral and emotional concerns. And with regard to us as parents, uh, we're more confident, we're less stressed, and most likely have less conflict with our partner if, if we positive in a parent way, in a, in a positive way. Sorry about that. So what does stay positive mean? First and foremost, building strong relationships with our kids, spending time with our kids, talking with our kids, showing them affection. One of the big strategies that we'll talk about tonight that Triple P uh, recommends is encouraging behaviors that you like. So looking for things that they do well and acknowledging them. I think as parents, and I, I say this as a parent myself, sometimes we get in modes when we only recognize the negative things that are happening and it just continues to increase the intensity in the household. So encouraging the behaviors you like, no matter how small, small they are. Teaching new behaviors and skills. So it's our job as parents to help our children learn skills, whether it be things from brushing their teeth, getting dressed, tying their shoes, tying their room, as they get a, little bit, as they get a bit older, taking, uh, taking ownership for some of the chores in the household. Setting clear limits and staying calm when our child misbehaves, um, because they will misbehave. Uh, knowing full well that as parents, it's okay for us to take a break. It's healthy for us to take a break, and I, Laura and I will talk about that as we move forward tonight. And setting clear limits so the kids know what the rules are. Don't always assume that they know what we want. We have to let them know what we want from them, what we expect from them. And lastly, staying positive means planning ahead. Planning ahead is a fantastic way to help us as parents in this busy lifestyles that we all have to stay organized, help ensure success, and that means less opportunity for boredom and mischief, and it, you can, it helps you anticipate problems before they occur. So that's kind of like the preamble of what we're gonna, about what Triple P is. So to start, there's five key principles to Triple P parenting, po Triple P's positive parenting program that kind of resonate through all, all the groups and all levels of Triple P. These five principles are creating a safe and interesting environment for our kids, creating a positive or having a positive learning environment, using assertive discipline, having realist, realistic expectations, and one that Lorelei and I, I agree sometimes gets lost in the shuffle for us as parents taking care of ourselves as parents, because I think sometimes as parents we love our kids unconditionally and we'll go to the great lengths to make sure their needs are met and sometimes that's at, that's at the expense of, of, of our self-care. So I always look at these five principles as the basic building block of Triple P and the foundation of Triple P. So today we're gonna look at applying these principles and other tips and strategies that Triple P suggests that we as parents can apply to everyday stressors that we are bound to encounter on a daily basis. And by all means, if there's any questions as we move forward, please just feel free to raise your hand. Lorelei will answer any questions that you have. So first and foremost, the first principle is creating a safe environment. So of course we wanna create a safe environment for our kids. It gives them a chance to explore, to play, to develop their skills, develop their independent skills. 
And in doing so, it means we don't have to hover over them all the time, and it allows us a chance as parents to relax, which doesn't happen often as parents. Um, key into what your kids are most interested in and what, like to, what they like to engage themselves in, because we'd like to provide many interesting things for our kids to do. No one knows your kids better than you, so key into what they're most interested in so they can occupy their time in a more productive way. Because leading into that, we do know that idle time and boredom will probably most likely lead to mischief or misbehavior. And as they get a bit older, and as they start to venture out a little bit, knowing who they're with and where they are and what they're doing at all times, no matter what age they are, and making that a staple in one of the rules in your household. So why should kids take risks? I'm sure you've all heard the term bubble wrap kids or helicopter parents. Of course, we all want to keep our children safe first and foremost. However, too much reliance on us as parents can impede their ability to grow and develop skills. Children learn by taking risks and making mistakes. They're learning opportunities. They get to learn their likes and, dis likes and dislikes. They get to learn and increase their problem solving skills. They get to learn to do things for themselves. They get to increase their independent skills and their decision making skills. And we like to encourage them to challenge themselves while offering them support. Kids are more apt to take, uh, step out of their comfort zone if mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, are gonna be there to support them. They're more apt to give that a try. And if they do, that's fantastic. Uh, help them create some goals, what they'd like to accomplish, as well as celebrating small gains and any accomplishments they make. If they step out of their comfort zone, you know, sometimes uh, someone was telling me a story yesterday, I believe, about their son starting judo, and he was really he's, he was really anxious about it. So the first step he did was he just walked into the to the judo place and he just watched and he observed. I mean, to me, that's a fantastic thing to step out of his comfort zone. So celebrate that accomplishment that he made. Now, as well, our kids are going to experience failure. They're going to experience disappointment because life does throw us curveballs. Uh, we want to teach them the skills to know this too shall pass and feelings of stress and disappointment and hurt and anger are normal. But our job as parents, if you think in terms of us as parents being the teachers, the role models, the coaches for our kids, our job at that particular time is to tap into what we know works best and teach them those coping strategies. So what works well for our kids when they're stressed, when they're hurt, when they're sad, or when they're upset? Is it deep breathing? Is it counting to 10? Is it listening to music? Is it going for a walk? Is it reading a book? Whatever it is that helps them self-regulate and self-manage their emotions, that's where we as parents come in as teachers and to help them cope, to cope a little bit. Screen time dilemma. I'm going to hazard a guess and say that this is a, this, many, I know Lorelai and I, um, we have many parents that come to us with concerns about screen time dilemma. Uh, screen time dilemma can be fun and entertaining for kids. It can be quite engaging for kids. However, some may tend to spend way too much time watching TV, on the computer, on their iPad, on their smartphone. And some parents uh, probably at times feel like banning all technology from your house. Obviously, that's as a mom or dad, that's your choice. However, bearing that in mind, whether we like it or not as adults, it's the way our children connect socially with their peers. And we as adults, we have to adapt. Um, it's a difficult thing for some of us to do, me being one of them. Um, I just recently got an iPhone and I think I've stepped into the new millennium and I think I'm, but I have no idea how to use it. I just like it for the sport apps things. Uh, but it is a different world out there. Um, <clears throat> it's an educational piece and as your child matures, it's a required part of their education and the schools have embraced education. You go into classrooms, you know, you come into our school at Maryville, most if not all kids have laptops or iPads and they're, you know, all schools have Wi-Fi now and they can access it on their phones in high school. So it's a fantastic piece. And I know one thing with my kids in particular is, you know, these kids are more tech savvy than, than I will ever be. So asking them their question, how do I do this? What do I do with this gadget here? It empowers them. They like to do that. Uh, the other thing about screen time dilemma, it can limit the time needed for the other important or engaging activities, whether it be going outside, extracurricular activities at school, friendships or social opportunities. So we want to be mindful of that as well. So how as parents do we find the right balance? 
As we talked about already, <clears throat> we need to adapt and educate ourselves. We need to teach our kids that there needs to be a healthy balance. Um, 24-7 access to gadgets is probably not a healthy thing, so we need to teach them a healthy balance. And as moms and dads, we need to consider the advantages of each device. Now, there's fantastic adv advantages to these devices, but there's also things that are really concerning for our kids that, you know, I'm sure you've talked about with your kids. They talk about it at length in school. Things like cyberbullying and their sexting and uh, things that they put on Facebook or Twitter and teaching our kids that once they put something out there, it can't come back. So making sure they know that that's, that's out there. And discussing and creating, discuss creating a balanced life as a family. So sit down, open up those lines of communications and talk to them about what is appropriate usage of screen time. When is it appropriate to use? When is it not appropriate to use? Ask yourself in your household, you know, do you, are your kids allowed to have their devices when they go to bed? One rule of thumb I always talk about with parents at groups is um, for those families that their kids have complete access to their gadgets, you have to start out small with baby steps. So we always say, what about dinner time as a family? That's a great time to say together collectively, we're going to put all our gadgets away at the table when we talk, when we go to dinner time for about a half an hour. That's a great time to start. And when you set reasonable, clear expectations based on your family's discussion, ensure that the kids are part of that process. They're more likely to be empowered if they're part of the decision-making process, especially as they get a little bit older. And leading into that, we also want to talk about, as adults, as mom and dad, modeling appropriate use of the gadgets. So if a family rule is not to have our devices at the dinner table, that includes mom and dad. And I always equate this to, if you have a family rule in your household that Laura and I will speak about later, if one of your family rules in your household is to speak quietly, we're not being real good role models if mom and dad are yelling across the house to come down for dinner or yelling about something else. So making sure that if we go back to what I said earlier about being one of the part of being a parent is being a teacher, a role model, making sure we're, appro we're modeling appropriate usage of the devices. So the second principle of Triple P recommends having a positive learning environment. So as parents, we need to be available to help our kids learn. That's one of our jobs. We want to establish predictability, consistency, and structure in our household because kids, youngsters, and teenagers in particular th thrive on predictability, consistency, and structure. So when your kids come to you and are looking for your attention, whatever age they are, stop what you're doing, make eye contact with them, get at their eye level if you need to, and as Lorelei so aptly says, listen with your eyes. It's a, I like that one, I like that saying and give them your undivided attention. They're coming to you, whether they want to tell you a story and spend time with you, whether they want to talk with you, they're coming to you to talk to you. Give them your undivided attention, because I think you'd all agree, I'm guilty of this probably on a daily basis. My daughter will say to me, Daddy, can you come here for a minute? One minute, dear, I'll be there, I'll be right there. One minute, one minute, and next thing one minute turns into 10 minutes. So stop what you're doing, and sometimes they don't want too much of your time. It might be five minutes, it might be 10 minutes but it doesn't have to be great lengths of time that we have to spend with our kids. It just, at that one particular moment when they want your attention, just ensure that you engage them. And give them some praise and let them know you like what they're doing. Notice what they do well, acknowledge it. Encouraging the behavior you like will increase the chances of it happening again and again and again. I always equate this to ourselves as adults, whether you're within your, your relationships with friends or your partner or at work, if someone tells you you're doing a good job and they acknowledge you doing a good job, we like to hear it, just as well as our kids like to hear it. Let them know that they're doing a jo good job and acknowledge what they do well. A few other tips for creating a positive learning environment include speaking nicely and calmly with our kids. It teaches them to be respectful of others and, and speak, politely, um, speak politely to others. One of the things we also like to teach our kids is something called incidental teaching. So when they come to us, we want to use that as a learning opportunity. If they ask us a question, don't be so quick to give them the answer. I know as parents, me included, sometimes it's just easier to give them the answer, or we're just out of a habit, we tell them the answer, but prompt them to try and solve the problem by ourselves, by, their, by themselves. Um, don't, be, don't be so quick, because if we can get really good at incidental teaching, 
when they're young, it's a lot easier to teach them problem solving skills when they get a bit older. So take those opportunities and prompt them through the process. Another part of a uh, positive learning environment is sharing our own experiences. So if a youngster comes to us and wants to talk to us about a particular thing going on, it's okay to share your experiences when you were their age because conversations are give and take. However, be mindful that as, as adults, as parents, sometimes when we do that, we'll become judgmental or we'll get into interrogation mode. We, won't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to take the flavor of the conversation. We want them to con continue to be on them and not to be about us. And the last piece about having a positive learning environment is uh, showing affection. Whether they're young kids or whether they're teenagers, all kids need to know they're that loved and cared for. So find a manner in which you're both comfortable with. You know, as a teenager, we have to, you know, we have to be cautious. But if, they're, if they want to be kissed or hugged or whatever it is, find a manner in which they're comfortable to show affection with your kids. Now we're going to get into helping kids solve problems for themselves. So problem solving takes a lot of practice, especially if it's something that they're not accustomed to in the household or at school. So we want them to start at a young age. For example, at a young age, they might be doing a puzzle and they might, might come to say, mom and dad, I don't know where this piece goes. So you might want to say, well, let's look at the shape of that puzzle. Let's look at the color of that puzzle. Where do you think it might go? As opposed to jumping right in and saying it goes right here. Because sometimes as adults, it's a lot easier for just to put it in a place and then move on but look at it as a teaching opportunity and encourage them to find their own solution because we want what we want to teach them is most problems have solutions so we want them to learn those skills and being able to feel confident enough to do so and then prompt them on the steps to solving a problem so those steps is something that as they get a bit older you know they come to you with a problem um, there are some steps so you first you got to identify what is the problem what is it that's bothering you, and what solution do you want to find? It's a great. It, 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 it's kind of twofold because you've not only engaged your child; they've come to you with a problem at that particular time. It's a perfect learning opportunity because they're motivated to learn. They want something out of it, whatever it is. So use that as a teaching opportunity. So you've established the problem. They've told you what they want as a solution. So you're going to ask them to say, "Okay, what are two or three options that you could come up with?" to solve this problem. Once they do that, walk them through the process and then, and then try to have them problem solve and come up with a consequence for each option. Once they select that option, have them give it a try and then review it when it's done. And you'll find that if you make that a practice in your household, those skills that they need to problem solve will come easier and easier. And of course, as always, praise their efforts. And what I neglected to say earlier with regards to the praise piece is the more descriptive and clear and succinct you are with your praise, the more effective it is. Um, if you come home from work and lo and behold, your kids have vacuumed the house for you and you were just blown away. You know, Lorelai, I, I, I can't, I, I'm so appreciative of you vacuuming the house for me while I, while I was away at work. That helps mom and dad so much in the house. Thank you. Especially the older they get, the more clear and distinct you are, the better it is. Saying good job and good work is great for the younger kids, but the more older they get, the more descriptive and clear you have to be. And it's known that growing, growing up in an environment that promotes problem solving will allow, will allow them the confidence to solve problems as they get older. So now Lorelai is going to talk about using assertive discipline, having realistic expectations, and having, taking, taking care of ourselves as a parent. Thanks. Uh, the third aspect of positive parenting is assertive discipline. And discipline is not a bad word, I'm here to tell you. Um, it teaches our children many things. It teaches them to accept limits and manage their feelings. It teaches them to take responsibility for their behavior. It also teaches them to think about the feelings and thoughts of or needs of other people, and it helps them to develop self-control. Assertive discipline works best when we make sure that some of the other aspects that Chris just spoke about are in place so that our children have a safe, interesting, and positive learning environment. And that involves showing affection, using the descriptive praise, and spending quality time 
time with our children. Quality time doesn't have to be big, long lengths of time, like a trip to Disney or a whole day at the park. It's those small, brief periods of time, like Chris spoke about, where when our children come to us, we stop what we're doing and actually listen to them. And that really shows our children that we care. So assertive discipline will work best when you're using all of those other strategies. Um, it also involves um, setting some ground rules and having realistic expectations for our children. And it is immediate, consistent, and decisive. So if we think about those things being immediate, consistent, and decisive, we also have to think about having a plan in place. So if um, you know that every time um, on the weekends, if I can use your example, that your children are playing video games and it's time to shut the video games off and it's a big problem, then you can come up with a plan on what we're going to do about this. So setting some ground rules, those ground rules should be few, they should be simple to follow, and they should be fair. And when you have those rules in place, discussing them with your children, so thinking about what your home rules are. So one of those home rules may be, as Chris mentioned earlier, we use a quiet voice in the house. Um, in our home, uh, one of the rules was you go to um, the person that you want to speak to rather than yelling across the room or across multiple rooms. Um, one of your house rules could be a half an hour of some sort of screen time a day and they could choose you know is that going to be a tv a video game um, so everybody in their home will be able to think of what rules are important to them and those rules come from our own values and um, the things that we want to encourage in our children so really those things are up to you uh, triple p is not um, what we call a prescriptive program. So we say you have to do it like this and this and this. It's figuring out in your family what's working and what's not working and coming up with a plan from there. Assertive discipline also, um, when we're making a plan in place, we want to think about realistic expectations. So if your child is misbehaving, oftentimes it's because they don't know what to do. And we can make the assumption that they know what to do, but they may not. They may also not have that skill yet. And so thinking about whether they're actually able to follow some rules or um, can they understand what you're saying to them is what we have to think about. And of course, um, if those problems are minor, sometimes they're annoyances to us. So it may be um, whining, it may be um, tattling. I'm trying to think of some more just minor behaviors that just might get on your nerves. <laughs> Interrupting, yeah, yeah. Um, so if those things are minor behaviors, then we can try and plan to ignore them. We don't have to have a rule about everything, okay? And remembering to always praise our child when they do what we want. As Chris said earlier, that um, the more we praise the behaviors that we like to see, the more likely that they will happen again. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, having a plan. Um, I think this might be a concern for lots of families. I've heard it in my work before anyways, and it was a concern for our family when my girls were younger, getting out the door on time, okay? So if we think about what we need in order to have a good plan for that, the first thing is to be organized. We wanna plan in advance. So thinking about where it's difficult in the morning for your family. So that might be the children getting dressed. It might be everybody getting all their things together. So if those are issues, again, um, in your home, then think about what can we do to solve that problem? It goes back to the problem solving again. So things like setting out clothes the night before, 
maybe packing up the bags. The children all get their backpacks and have them ready at the door. Um, for mine, it was jumping down to the fourth point, leaving time for yourself to get ready in the morning. I know if I was up and almost ready before I woke my daughters up, then it went much better. The morning just just flowed. Even when they were teenagers and could get themselves ready, um, it just made the whole morning go much better. Setting some ground rules. Remember, again, that they need to be few, fair, and easy to follow. So it might be that you get yourself all dressed before you come downstairs. Um, if you allow TV time in the morning, it might be that they have to be all ready, dressed, and um, their bags at the door before the TV goes on. Okay. Um, another thing is think about the routine and how you want it to go and talk to your kids about it. Involve them in the planning. Let them know that um, this is what's going to happen in the morning and we'll go through the day um, to get out the door. Don't assume that they already know. I think that happens a lot. You assume that they know what they should be doing and they don't and then things go, go wrong from there. Um, what else are we going to say about that? Um, making it fun at first. So if you're trying to get ready in the morning, it might be sort of like the incentive chart that you use. So you can set a little timer, the first one ready and down the stairs before the timer gets off. Uh, or if you're ready, it doesn't have to be the first one. You don't have to make it a competition. Um, but if you're all ready and downstairs before the timer goes off, you can have whatever you decide on. It could be an extra book at bedtime. It could be a, a special snack in their lunch. Again, involve your kids because they will be able to tell you what they want for an incentive. And it may surprise you. Um, when my daughter was a teenager, we were having some issues with homework and it was not working out. The way it was going was not working out. So we had to come up with a new plan and I was suggested that um, we pay her for her homework. And I was like, ah, oh, what? <laughs> no way, that is not a good idea. But what we were doing was not working and I was ready to try something else. So I said to her, this is what we're thinking. What do you think about that? I think that's a great idea. And so she, I have to ask her, how much does she think that she should be paid? And I was thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to go broke. And her, her um, thought was it would be a loony for, for the week if she did her homework each night. And I was like, wow, okay, I can do that. <laughs> um, so your kids may surprise you with some of the things that they come up with. And it doesn't always have to be monetary. It could be, like I said, an extra book at bedtime or an extra game or something that they like. Okay? Um, avoid repeating instructions or nagging. So in Triple P, we talk about how we give instructions. And we call these the start and the stop routine. So if you want your child to start doing something, that would be things like cleaning up their toys, um, shutting off the TV, coming to dinner, um, getting ready for school. Um, those are all start routines. A stop routine is what you want your child to stop doing. I'm, I work with children in the preschool age, so I'm going to use some of these examples. Stop jumping on the bed. Stop hitting your brother. Stop running in the house. So those stop routines, those, I'll go back to the start. If we want our child to start doing something, we are going to go close to them, call their name, get down on their level, and tell them exactly what we want to do, what we want them to do. I'm gonna use Chris as a demonstration, okay? Chris, I want you to clean up your toys and come for dinner. And then we're gonna wait five seconds. It may seem like a really long time, but some children need longer to process information. If he does as I've asked, so he cleans up his toys, he comes for dinner, then I'm going to give that descriptive praise, which looks like this. Thanks for cleaning up your toys and coming for dinner right away. Okay, so you're telling him exactly what you want. If he doesn't do as I've asked, he's still playing, 
Then I'm going to repeat the instruction again. Wait five seconds. If he's done as he's asked, then I give him that descriptive praise again. If not, then we think about what the consequence could be. So it could be a logical consequence, like the toys go away and he doesn't get to play with them after dinner. It could be um, a quiet time or a time out where they have to move to the side. And those things are not meant to be punitive. Those things are meant for the child to get composure, gain control, and then come back and try again. Okay, so we use the start instruction twice. If it's a stop instruction, we only say it one time. And all of this in assertive discipline means having a plan. So you know exactly, and your child knows exactly what will earn them a consequence. Could be the quiet time or time out. We use those for um, some more severe behaviors like hitting, swearing, spitting, those kinds of things. Um, those things, you have a plan in place and your child knows about it and you're gonna stay calm because you have that plan and you follow through each time being immediate, consistent, and decisive. Just one more thing I wanted to say about um, having your children participate in routines. We want to encourage independence in our children, and so having them be as independent as possible um, will help getting out the door in the morning and uh, as well. However, on that note, if your children are not able to do things such as maybe dress themselves or make their own lunch or make their bed, whatever um, the requirements are for the morning, during the week when you're trying to get out the door is not a good time to teach them. You want to take some time when you have more time. So it might be in the evenings, it might be in the weekends, to teach them the skills that they need to get ready independently. The fourth aspect of Triple P parenting is having realistic expectations. Nobody's perfect, you're not perfect, and your kids aren't perfect. And if you're expecting your child to be always happy, polite, and cooperative, you're setting yourself up for some disappointment because it's not going to happen. When Tracy showed that video of that child, she said, you know, this is maybe something we'd like to try and prevent. You probably won't prevent it, but hopefully we can give you some ways to uh, deal with it and, and manage it. Don't forget, please, to be easy on yourself as well. We want to be the very best parents that we can be for our children, but we aren't perfect, and that's not realistic. So we make mistakes, our children make mistakes, and that's where we learn from it. Okay. Um, some of the common parenting traps that we can get into um, if we're not having realistic expectations is um, the criticism trap or as long as you live under my roof, you will abide by my rules trap. This is where we um, often criticize our children. Um, we turn into threatening, yelling, arguing, and this leaves both parents and children feeling not very good at all about themselves. And so if you find yourself in that battle a lot, it's time to change up what you're doing. Uh, at the end, we will um, have some information about some of our uh, other parenting groups that we have in the community as well, if you're looking for something more from tonight. The next one is to leave them alone or do whatever you want trap. This is when our children are doing their own thing, they're quiet, um, I don't know about you, but when my girls were quiet, playing very cooperatively, which they didn't do often, that was the time when I sat back and went, oh, this is so nice. <laughs> don't anybody move or say anything. However, if they started yelling and arguing, what happened? Very quickly, you are there in a flash. So if this is a common occurrence and happens all the time, our children are very quickly going to learn that that's the way they get attention. They want attention and they will get it either positively or negatively. So as parents, please be aware that when you're teaching a new skill or behavior, such as maybe getting along with their sibling, if they are cooperative for two minutes, you need to move in very quickly and give them that descriptive praise. I really like the way you're playing with your sister. 
And then what happens is they might play the next time for five minutes without arguing. Again, you're going to move in there after that time and say, I really like the way you're getting along with your sister. You did a great job letting her have a turn first. Okay? Because, as we said before, behavior that we pay attention to and give praise to is a behavior that is probably going to happen again and again and again. The next trap is the perfect parent trap. As I just mentioned earlier about having realistic expectations, there is no such thing as a perfect parent, and trying to be one will just lead to disappointment, some anger maybe, and some guilt. And the last trap is the martyr trap. Chris touched a little bit on this earlier, and this is where we neglect our own needs. We don't have time um, for ourselves, we devote every waking moment that we have to our children and really good parenting only happens when we take care of ourselves what can we do to get out some out of these traps the first thing is to stay calm and take a break please recognize when you've had enough it's much like the quiet time and time out for our children they move to the side they're able to regroup calm down and get themselves together we as parents need to do that sometimes too Make our children a part of discussion. So if there's a problem in your house, we've said this several times tonight, get them involved. If they are part of the solution, you will much more likely have buy-in from them. Engage and praise. Be involved. Move in when your children are doing what you like to see to encourage that behavior that you want to see more and give the descriptive praise. And remember, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. We always make mistakes and we can learn from them. And make sure um, that you uh, take care of yourself, which leads us into our last aspect of Triple P, which is taking care of yourself as a parent. It's much easier when you get the balance right to look after your own needs. You want to get support from friends, from family. If you have a partner, work as a team. You might not always agree in that moment how your partner has said something to the children or handled a situation. You can talk about that later, but be a united front. Looking after yourself means you'll feel more patient and calm when your child needs you. And I think that um, is evident in most people's lives. If we are uh, tired, stressed out, our patience for our children is much less than if we're taking care of ourselves. We'll talk a little bit about taking care of yourself and how we can juggle our family and work. I think that's another big concern in today's society. Everybody is very busy, working, extracurricular activities. As you said, during the week, you know, you have a lot of things going on. So how can we juggle family and work? Uh, one of the rules of thumb is that when you're at home, we want to make family our priority and our focus. And when we're at work, then we make that our focus. And the key is to get the right balance. Just like Chris talked about in screen time, one thing of too much is too much. We have to get the right balance. So um, think about when we are under pressure from either work or our family, it can seriously affect our lives in lots of ways. It's stress, you know, it can spill over into different areas. So if we're very stressed at home, it can spill over into our work. When we're stressed at work, it can spill over into our home. We might argue more, have problems with relationships, sometimes even suffer um, from health problems as well. One of the ways to um, juggle work and family, we talked a little bit about this in our getting out the door on time, um, but thinking about in the mornings, I know if I got to work 
and it was a smooth morning in our home. The rest of my day went really well. So being organized, thinking about what you need to get to work on time, teaching your children to be independent as well helps to make the morning run more smoothly. We talked already a little bit about um, a leaving routine, so how we get out the door in the morning in our group rules. Avoid, avoid conflict before work. So if an issue comes up, we want to just tell our children, you know, maybe we'll talk about that when we get home and make sure you have time to talk about that when you get home. Avoid scheduling early work um, meetings in the morning, working with your partner, and of course choosing quality childcare can really help with the stressors of juggling family and life. If you know your children are well cared for, if they're preschoolers or you have your before and after school um, care, then you can know that um, they're being well cared for and are safe and that can help with your day much, much more. When at work, have realistic expectations about your work. Tackle your difficult tasks at the beginning of your shift, if that's the, the kind of job that you have, so that you're not as stressed out when you're ready to leave to go home. Sometimes finding out about workplace perks. So um, there might be time that you are able to take off or maybe flex some time if you work what, late one evening. I know we have that opportunity at my at my job, we can work uh, late one evening and then that leaves us time for other things during the day if we need doctor's appointments or things like that. On your way home from work, think about some ways that you can unwind and relax because I think it would be fair to say, oftentimes when we get home and walk in that door, you're in for a whole nother routine, right? I see some people laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Change the hat out quick. So focus on your on your way home. Um, be mindful, as Chris always says, about where you're at right now and just enjoy that time. That helps us um, to think about when we get home. We don't are not already stressed out before we even walk in the door. And really thinking about when you do get home, is it necessary to have that homework done immediately, to have a, a really nice supper on the table, it's important. It is important um, and healthy, but again, go back into that plan. You know, it, can we prep it the night before? Can the kids do a little bit when they get home from, from school before you get home, depending on the age of your children? So do some pre-planning around that. And be realistic. It's not always going to work out. You're going to have some nights where it is a bomb <laughs> and things just did not go the way that you thought they would go, but that's okay. There's always the next day to try again. So I hope this information was helpful to you. I'm just going to go over a little bit about our community partnerships and Triple P. So we have the steering committee. Uh, Tammy Drasloff is the person that you would speak to when you want to register for some um, programs out in the community. She wasn't able to be here tonight. And there is also um, partnership. So we have Bridging Family Conflict, Children First, City of Windsor, Family Respite Services, Family Services Windsor, John McGivney Children's Center, Maryvale Adolescent and Family Services, The Inn of Windsor, the Windsor Essex Children's Aid Society, the Windsor Essex County Health Unit, and Regional Children's Center. So there are trained Triple P professionals from all of those agencies, and we volunteer our time to do events like this evening, as well as out in the community.